Hi, I'm going to read Begging for Change by Sharon G. Flake, chapters 25 through 32. Chapter 25. Hey, Reds, I like it, a boy says, making an outline of my body with his hands. When I look away, he blows me a kiss. When I look, when I look his way... He blows me a kiss from the window of a shiny black car with tinted windows and big silver rims. He tells me to come talk to him a minute. I shake my head and turn away, but I can feel my cheeks burning. You growing up all right, Odd Job says, staring at the boy. Guess I need to be calling you plain old raspberry, huh? Not raspberry cherry and stuff like that. We left Mama back home. Go lay down. Sorry, we left Mama back home cleaning up and waiting for the glass man to come. Me and Odd Job going to bank, going to the bank, then out to eat. Everybody knows Odd Job, so we get stopped six times before we even get to the bank. When we walk into Goody's restaurant, Odd Job opens the door and lets me go inside first. Any boy that don't open the door or pull out the chair for you ain't worth your time, he says. Boys my age don't care about stuff like that. Odd job don't want to hear that. You got to make a boy treat you the way you want to be treated. But first, he says, opening up the menu, you got to know how you want to be treated. Oh, I don't want to talk about boys with him, so I change the subject. When the waitress comes, Odd job asks me what I want to eat. I order waffles. Me too, he says, licking his lips. But make mine three orders of three each. Bring me a bowl of blueberries and plenty of butter. He stops the waitress when she turns to walk away. How about I order a bacon, some eggs, and a large orange juice, too? The busboy over the other table keeps staring my way. I don't take my eyes off the fork and knife until my food comes. The boy's treating you all right, ain't they? I'll jump ass. Why do you want to talk about that stuff? I say, putting my napkin in my lap. Ajab says he just noticing how the boys are looking at me, especially Sado, he says, smearing butter on his waffles and toast. You like him, huh? I'm playing with the food on my plate. You like him or not? I smile. I try to eat a piece of bacon, but I can't stop grinning. He's all right. When we're done eating, Ajab pulls out his cash. A gentleman always pays for a lady's meal, he says, and leaves a tip. You know a brother is chip, cheap and trifling if he eats and don't give the waitress her due when he's done. I look at him, wonder why he's telling me all this. When we get out, when we get back outside, Ajab asks me if I miss my father. I belch and keep walking. When your father was in his right mind, he treated your mom like he had, she had golden feet and diamond eyes, he says, letting out a belch too. We walked for blocks. We walked for blocks, not talking to each other. Then Odd Job says he's seen Daddy not too long ago. I stop walking, press my fingers to my lips, and close my eyes. He ain't coming back, is he? Odd Job's big brown arms cover me. His muscles bunch when he squeezes me tight. He ain't stealing you. He ain't stealing from you no more. He says. Me and him talked about that. I wiped my eyes and looked up at his. I wipe my eyes and look up at his. They are burnt toast brown and got long red lines shoot through the white parts, like he's way past tired. You get back my money, I ask. Odd job turns me loose, starts walking again. He says he would have got my dough, but wasn't none of it left by the time he caught up to Daddy. I ask if he went looking for him. Odd job didn't say yes or no, just that he put word out that Daddy better steer clear of Mama and me. We almost back at Odd Job's spot when I ask him if he would ever hurt Daddy. He doesn't answer, just says, can't nobody do nothing worse to Daddy than he already done to himself. He's right, I guess, but I can't help wondering what Odd Job said or did to Daddy to get him to stay away from us for good. Chapter 26. <sighs> Finally, some good news. We moving into that house in Pecan Landings. Mama went to the hearing today and the judge told the people, told those people who live around there 
that he will hold them in contempt of court if they even if they try to interfere with us moving in. Mama says we can move in right away. Today is July 1st. We move it in there one month from today. I'm thinking about this while I'm sitting in front of our place, talking to Mai and her cousins. They're headed for the market not far from here to buy some ginger. My dad says it's cheaper at that store, Mai says. This is the first time I'm meeting her cousins. The little one says her name is Ling. She's six years old, short and cute. Got long, straight black hair down to her navel. Crooked front teeth and blue eyeglasses shaped like stars. Ling's sister's name, sister is named Subak. She's 13 and really pretty. Her hair is short and spiked high on top. It's black, but the tips are as white as glue. I don't know what her eyes look like because of the sunglasses. Maya asks if I want to go with them to the store. I lock up the house first, and try to make conversation with Ling while we walk. She acts like she ain't got no tongue. She hunches up her shoulder or shakes her head no when I ask her something. When we get to the store, Ms. Mai says for her and Subak to wait outside with the dog. They brought it with them from California. Oh, they make me sick, Mai says, smacking her forehead with both hands. Every chance I get, I ditch them. When we walk up the cookie aisle, when we walk up the cookie aisle, Mai opens a package of chocolate sandwich cookies, the kind with thick white cream inside. She looks up and down the aisle and pulls out four of them. Here, she says, handing me two. I shake my head no. She shoves two into her mouth and two, her into, two into her pocket. Slips the package back on the shelf, then starts, starts walking real fast. I ain't never seen my take what wasn't hers before. I tell her that, too. She roll her eyes. She wasn't stealing. Says it wasn't stealing, just sampling, and that's all. Maya's walking up and down every aisle. Even though we already got ten bottles, got the ten bottles of ginger she came for, she keeps talking about her cousins. Since they came, people stay on my case, she says, pulling out a cookie and stuffing it in her mouth. We went to a Korean grocery store yesterday, and the owner gave them free cookies and gum. Subak had to make him offer me something. I told him to keep that crap. Mai wipes black crumbs off her lips, then hands the cashier the money. We walk out the door and up the street. Subak and Ling trying to keep up, but Mai and me moving so fast they end up half a block behind. I make Mai stay put so they can catch up. When they do, a boy sticks his out a card window and starts speaking gibberish and pointing at Subak. His braids are undone and his hair is all over his head. Hey, you, you, he says, pointing to her. Come here. I got something to ask you. Mai takes the last cookie out of her pocket and throws it at him. It bounces off the card and gets smashed to pieces when the tire rolls over it. See, she says, walking past. See what my father did? Made everything worse. Then she takes off running. Subak snaps her fingers and moves her hip to the rest of this, to music the rest of us don't hear. Evil, she says, pulling up her sunglasses and staring at me. My is evil. I don't say nothing. She wakes up mean and goes to bed mean and is mean in between, she laughs. Hey, that rhymes. Ling swoops down and hugs her dog, Couch. They call him that because he lays on the couch all the time at home. Then he takes her fingers, then she takes her fingers and pulls his lips back, trying to get him to smile. It doesn't bother me, Subok says. I look at her, wondering what she's talking about. The way people stare, that doesn't bother me. I just figure they think I'm cute. Subok takes off her shades and sticks them in her back pocket. Except for the brown of my skin and the crinkles in her hair, them two look almost the same. Even their teeth are shaped alike. We stop at the corner store and get something to drink. The boy whose father owns this store never pays me no attention. Now he is sweet as pie, saying thank you and yes for no real reason at all. Putting our stuff right in a bag, not asking me if I want one or not, like he usually do. I see him making eyes at Subak. I don't care. I hate him anyway. Subak takes Ling's hand when we cross the street. Where I live in L.A., there's all kinds of boys. Black, Chinese, white, Hmong, mixed, Mexican, Korean. Shoot, she says, holding out her hand so she can take a sip of my pop. Around my way, a girl can have a different color boyfriend every day of the week. Nobody stares. Nobody cares. Maya's waiting on my steps, 
when we get there. Subak ain't in no hurry, though. She stops on the corner. She says she wants to check out the boys. Ling races the dog to the house. You like it here? I ask Subak. I like the boys. They're cute. They ask for my phone number all the time, she says, smiling. At home, my father is strict, watches everything I do. I ask Subak if she speaks Korean. She says yes, they have to speak it at home. We're on my front steps now. Couch is across the street, lying on a sofa somebody put out for trash last month. Ling is with him. Subak pulls loose strings from her shorts. Ling and my father sit and talk Korean all day long, she says, standing and waving waving to some boys who are breaking their necks to check her out. In one way, I'm like Mai, she says. English is good enough for me. Comprendes? She laughs. The three of us sit there for a while. Then Mai says it's time to leave. Before she takes off, I ask her how her lessons are going. Subak answers her for, for her. She has to spend one hour a day speaking Korean with me and Ling. Ling looks both ways before she crosses the street. She sits on Mai's lap and traces her tattoo with her little finger. Can I get one of these? She asks. You ain't black, Mai says. Ling looks like she doesn't know what Mai's talking about. A little bit. I have to be a little bit black if you're my cousin, right? She starts staring at her arm. Subak reaches her arm out to Ling. I'll get you a tattoo, one for little kids. The big ones hurt, right, Mai? Mai looks down at her arm. I guess, she says, standing up to leave. Chapter 27. Firecrackers. That's what Odd Job's got in his hands when he knocks on our front door. Ain't they illegal? I ask, picking up a long, skinny red one and rubbing some of the powder off. People lose their eyes and fingers all the time with these things. Odd Job squeezes my nose. Party pooper, he says, heading for the refrigerator. Pulling a all right, pulling a tub of no-name ice cream out of a green plastic garbage bag and putting it in the freezer. The 4th of July without fireworks is like cake without ice cream. Useless, he says, heading back out the door and down to the backyard. I go to my room, open the window, and sit on the ledge with my legs hanging out. It's 9 o'clock at night, and our party is just getting started. <whistles> Mama called... Mama calls it our it's about time something good happened to us party in celebration of the new place we're moving to. Our yard looks like one of those department store windows. Mama's got red Christmas lights strung along the inside of the wooden fence, circling our tree and twisted around some of the branches. Long thin poles with cups of fire hanging from them are stuck in the ground. Red, white, and blue Christmas bulbs are stacked in clear plastic bowls on three tables she borrowed from Ms. Evelyn. And all the people who come in get a red, white, or blue shooting star drawn on their cheek in glitter paint by Janae. We ain't never had a party before, but people are going to be talking about this one forever. Mama cooked up a storm. Grilled chicken, burgers, and hot dogs, made potato salad, fruit salad, and tuna molds shaped like a cat. Mom, Mai's mom brought over egg rolls and fortune cookies. Dr. Mitchell went to the bakery and brought, brought cakes and pies. Me and Janae made lemonade, iced tea, and Kool-Aid. Sado brought over six cans of warm red pop, but I didn't crack on him. It's the thought that counts. I swing my legs over, just over my window ledge. I feel the hot air blow over me. Close my eyes and smell the lavender blooming like crazy all over our backyard. Ming and Janae are sitting by the fence, pointing up at the fireworks that the city just set off. Odd Job is playing spades with his girlfriend, Donielle. Mama, Dr. Mitchell, Ming's mom and dad, Subak, Ling, and Miss Evelyn from across the street. Sato and Ling are playing with Couch when Sato points at me and says, I'm coming up, with Couch following behind. My bedroom is a mess. Mess. You can see dirty socks, jeans, and t-shirts shoved under my bed from when Mama told me to quit clean up earlier. But I don't try to straighten things now. I reach over, dim the lights, and hope Sado don't trip over nothing. Couch licks my fingers when I pat his head. Sado sits down next to me. Man, he says, pointing up at the sky. Why can't we have fireworks all the time? I nod my head up and down. I lick over him look over at him and see red and white lights in his eyes, just like just when more fireworks explode way up above us. 
Sado tells me to move closer to him. Then he pet, puts his arm around my shoulder. I look down to see if Mama's watching. She's busy showing Janae her plants. Oddjob's busy telling Dr. Mitchell that he needs to stick to doctoring because he sure can't play no cards. So them two ain't paying me no attention neither. Sado asks me about Zora. How come she ain't here? I tell him she's at her mom's for the weekend. Her mother's planning a trip to London and Zora gets to go. Sado's get, getting, sorry, Sado's sitting so close to me I can't even look up or I'm going to be staring right into his nose. So I swallow, then clear my throat and wonder if my breath stinks. We sit there, stiff as the poles, holding the fire in the backyard. Then he leans over and tries to kiss me. I turn around away and ask if Couch, ask Couch if he's hungry. For some ribs or barbecue chicken, I say, rubbing his tail. Sado leans over. All those flowers your mom planted, he says, pointing around the whole yard, makes it look like your yard don't even belong around here, he says. Like somebody stole it from Pecan Landings and is hiding it here. My eyes follow his fingers. I smile when I see the row of orange begonias I planted by the fence the other day. And the pink, white, and red rose bushes that have been growing like crazy all summer. That bushy thing that looks like weeds is lavender, I tell him. And the blue stuff over there crawling over the fence is morning glory. Sato takes my hand and points to a corner of the yard with tall things growing in it. What's that, he asks, but he tricks me, and before I can answer him, he kisses me right on the lips, just like Ming and Janae. I ain't never been kissed before. When I open my eyes, he's staring straight at me. Your eyes are supposed to be closed, I tell him, kicking my legs out like I'm high up on a swing. He's smiling. Why? Because? Well, I like mine open, he says, taking his arm from around my shoulder and holding my hand. I kick my feet out again. Who you kissed before? He rubs the little hairs over his lip. Just you, he says, soft and low. I feel his fingers over mine and his lips getting close again. My heart is tick tick ticking in my chest. Oh my goodness, my head is spinning for real from the sweet smell coming from the cologne on his neck and the flowers in the yard. Sado, you crazy boy! Dr. Mitchell says when Sato's soft lips touch mine again. You, down here, now, Mama says, jumping up from the table, shaking her fist in the air. Everyone in the whole yard is staring up at us. Busted, Ming yells out. Man, Sato says, helping me off the window ledge and holding my hand all the way to the front door. I stop him in the vestibule. They're going to jump all over you, I say, talking about Mama, Ajab, and Dr. Mitchell. That's all right. He says, looking right at me, you was worth it. Here we go, 32. I'll put a bookmark so I don't forget. Chapter 28. Before Sado even gets one foot in the backyard, Wadjob grabs him by the arm and says he needs to talk to him a minute. Mama got me over here in the corner, saying that it's not right for a girl to have a boy in her room. I know you think it was only a kiss, she says, tucking my hair behind my ear. But remember, you are just 14. There will be plenty of time for things like that when you're older. I tell Mama that she can trust me. Then I go over by the bushes near the fence, close my eyes, and remember how good it felt being kissed by Sado. Sado's your boyfriend, Ling says, sneaking up on me, reaching out her arm so I can pick her up. Dr. Mitchell is minding my business again, pinching Ling's cheeks and saying, Raspberry's too young to have a boyfriend. She kissed him like this, Ling says, taking off her glasses, pushing her lips out, then pressing them to my cheek so hard it hurts. Ouch, she cries, holding her mouth. I bit my tongue. She tells Subak she wants a Band-Aid. Subak is with Janae and Ming. You don't need a Band-Aid, Ling, she says, coming over and looking inside her mouth. Stop bugging me. You say mean things just like my, Ling says, squeezing my neck tight. When Sado walks over to us, Ling almost jumps out of my arms to try to get to him. He got his arms stretched out to her, but his eyes on me. Don't fall, he says, yanking at her cornrows, Janae put in two days ago. Subak takes a swig of soda, then she says, then says she wishes Mai was here. Mai is on punishment for smart-mouthing her dad again. Subak stands up on a crate and looks over the fences at Miracle in them. 
They've been hanging out there for the last three days, partying half the night, setting trash cans on fire and playing music so loud, Mama almost called the cops. I asked Mama not to say nothing to him, just to let them move around, let, just to let us move from around here and not think no more about them. She said that wasn't hard. She was tired after all the nonsense with Shakita. Besides, I got to think about you. I'm not here all the time. I don't want miracles starting up with you while I'm gone. Hey, cops, Subak says. Ming tells her to move over, and he stands on a chair behind her. Sato just opens the gate to get a better look. Mama's inside with our job and Dr. Mitchell getting more food and ice. So we all sneak out, even though Mrs. Kim and Miss Evelyn say we shouldn't. It's miracle in trouble again. Some boy is holding her hands behind her back, telling her to cool down before the cops haul her away. When she sees me, she goes off, starts cussing, asking us what we looking at. She yelling at me, saying she's still going to kick my butt for getting her girl put away. Janae's the one who says we need to just, we need to get Ling back inside. Ling keeps asking what the girl did wrong. None of us answer her. Hey, miracle, Sato says. You're going to need a miracle to get out of this one. I pop him in the head and ask him if he's trying to get me killed. Mama comes out front too, and so does Dr. Mitchell. He's standing behind her with his uh, he's standing behind her with his arms wrapped around her waist. A young girl like that, what does she have to be mad about all the time? He says, taking Mama's hand, pressing it to her to his cheek. We all walk back inside after the cops settle Miracle down and tell her she'd better make sure she don't find no more trouble tonight. Mama tells all of us to get a glass or a can of something because she wants to make a toast. To good times and good friends, she says, holding her can of red pop in the air. Ming's got his arm, right arm wrapped around Janae's neck. He touches her glass with his, then to mine and Sado's too. Yeah, he says, here's to all that stuff you just said. At midnight, we set off the fireworks. Janae, me, and Ling hold hands and run around the yard in circles, holding sparklers high in the air. When mine burns out, sorry, when mine burns out, I go get another one. Sato's right behind me, whispering, I liked it, kissing you. I take a deep breath. I look at all the pretty lights in the yard and listen to everyone laughing and talking. Me too. I say loud enough for even Mama to hear. It took us all, oh, sorry, chapter 29. It took us all week to clean up from the party. That's okay, though, because I ain't never going to forget how much fun I had. Janae and them still talking about it, asking me when I'm going to get off punishment for kissing Sado. I tell them I don't know. Mama ain't saying just yet. It's different now between Sado and me. When we at odd jobs, he stares at me all the time. I can feel his eyes on me even when my back is turned. Every once in a while, Oddjob grabs him by the ears. I ain't paying you to stare at Raspberry Boy. I'm paying you to work. Then Oddjob comes over to me and smiles. Now you've done ruined him for good, he says. His mind used to be on work. Now it's on you. Might have to fire that boy. I tell Oddjob not to do that. Say he was making money so he can give some to his mom. It ain't his fault. That you're so pretty, Oddjob says, pulling me by my hair. I wore it down today. It's sticking to my neck, itching me in all this heat. But Sado says he likes it this way. Sado's soaking wet with sweat on our way home. He stops by an open fire plug and sits down under it. His sneakers bubble up every time he takes a step. Feels good, he says, squeezing water from his shorts while we're, walk while we're walking. I'm trying to think of something to say to him, but words won't come out of my mouth. All I do is smile. All he does is stare at me. Then look at the ground. A few blocks away, he stops and points. Ain't that your dad over there? My heart starts pounding. I look up. There he is, sitting on the curb, leaning against a big trash can, plastic trash can, legs spread wide open, head down, no shirt, no shoes, no shame, I think. Cop's going to bust that bum's head wide open, some man says, like he ain't, can't wait for it to happen. I look over and see a cop car pull up, lights flashing. I hope you don't crack your father one with that nightstick, Sato says to me. Let's go, I tell him, but my feet ain't moving. Sato takes my hand. Maybe he's hurt or something. 
drunk or trying to come down from that mess he's been taking, I say. You staying? I'm not, I snap. We start walking. Sato's looking back. Sato's still looking back at Daddy. Get up, the cop says to Daddy. You can't stay here. Daddy starts throwing punches. Out comes the nightstick. Next thing you know, the cop whacks him upside the head. Blood runs down the side of his face. Don't hit my father, I scream, running over to him. Girl, another police officer says, holding my hand up in the air. You better calm yourself. I'm not afraid of him. He's sick. Why are you hitting him just because he's sick? Daddy's blood is so dark, it almost looks black. It's all over the place. On his shorts, dripping onto concrete, squished between the gloved fingers of the other crop, cop trying to cuff him now. I bend down in his bend down and whisper in his ear, Daddy, it's Wasbury. You hear me? I say, taking the tip of my shirt and wiping blood out his eye. He lifts his head up and looks at me with one eye. Hey, baby girl. The cop pulls me by the arm. This your father? I nod my head yes. Watch another cop car pull up to the curb, lights flashing. Well, you can visit him at county. He's going to jail. Traffic on, traffic on Madigan Street ain't hardly moving. Everybody is staring at us. A man in a gray suit and gray sunglasses yells out his window. Lock the drunk up. I look down at the blood on my shirt and my sneakers. Raspberry, Daddy says when they got him to his feet and made him walk over to the squad car. I love you, Raspberry girl. I look at him. He ain't wearing shoes and his feet are black and blistered. My stomach flips. My mouth tastes like acid. Next thing I know, vomit is coming out my mouth and nose. The cop is cursing, saying this is the way his whole stinking day has been going. I can hear Daddy cursing at the cops, saying to take the cuffs off so he can make sure that I'm all right. They shove him in the car anyway. Soft, warm fingers start to rub my back and shoulders. Then a woman says for me to relax and just let it all out. You'll feel better when you're done, she says, handing me a bunch of tissues. She wipes my face and mouth, opens her half-empty bottle of water, and hands it to me. I shake my head no at first. Germs, I think. But then I take it and drink it anyway. Every drop. The woman walks off and leaves me when, the other, when another policeman comes over and asks, Is he really your father? I wipe my mouth with the back of my hand. Yeah, I say, feeling Sato move closer to me. Get in, the cop, car, the cop tells me, opening the door. I'll take you both home. I look at him. Home? But he doesn't live. The cop smacks his lips. He goes with you or goes to county. Loitering is an offense. I can lock him up or take him home. What's it going to be? The tall cop. The tall cop is me and daddy's color with moles all over his face. He looks hot in his tight blue uniform. Mad too. Raspberry, daddy says, begging me. All I need is a little time to clean up and sleep this off. I think about my money, how he ain't mind stealing it from me before. No, I say, turning my back on him. Let's go, buddy, the cop says, pushing daddy. Raspberry, daddy says, please. My tongue rolls over my teeth and I smash my lips together when I feel myself ready to say for him to come in, to come go with me. For him to come go with me. That doesn't make sense. I'm going to quit. For real I am, he says, staring over at me. My father has the prettiest eyes when he ain't on that stuff. They the color of honey with splashes of green, a lady at the grocery store told him once. They cloudy now, like the eyes of old slimy fish they try to sell you at the market long after they should have been trashed. Mama, he's going to like you coming to our place, I say, giving the cops the name of our street. The policeman tells me to get in the car. Sado too. In a few minutes, he's pulling up to our place. He don't even help me get Daddy to the door. Me and Sado do that. We could have locked him up, one of them says, leaning out the car window. You caught us on a good day, I guess, he laughs. The woman on the police radio station starts talking. The siren and lights go on. The car pulls away from the curb and goes up the street real fast, almost hitting somebody's car, trying hard to get off our street. Chapter 30. You can't stay here, I say to my father. He's crawling to the top of my bed, rolling onto his stomach and pushing my hand away when I say he's got to go. We just got here, but I already changed my mind about helping him out. Mama's going to find out and go nuts again. Then she ain't going to trust me never no more. 
Daddy's head is still bleeding. Blood is all over my sheet, on the floor in my room, on the rug in the living room. I'm walking in circles using a wet sponge to wipe blood off my fingers and from beneath my nails, telling him again and again, oh, you gotta go, now. He's sleepy, balled up like a baby with his back, his black feet dirtying up my pink spread. Use some gloves, Sato says, carrying the buckets to the bathroom. You don't know if he has AIDS or not. We walk back to my room, water spilling over the sides of the bucket and onto the floor. The knot in Daddy's head is as fat and wide as a donut hole. His eye is still swollen shut. It hurts. <clears throat> Excuse me. It hurts, says Daddy says over and over again. Sato wrings out a wet rag and hands it to me. He needs a doctor. I look at him, then back at Daddy. Doctors don't come to your house, I say. Sato dips the rag in the bucket, starts wiping the blood away. You want to do it? He says, handing it to me. I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to clean him either if he wasn't my dad. Do his, do his feet then, okay? They are so dirty. They look like they hurt. He puts on a second pair of plastic gloves and reaches for a rag. Maybe Dr. Mitchell should come. I squeeze bloody water out the rag. No, he would tell Mama. It don't take Sato long to clean Daddy's feet, even though he had to wash them three times, for they was mostly clean. And it's easier than I thought to get the blood out the rug. But we can't get Daddy's head to stop bleeding, no matter what we do. In the last hour, we changed the bandage three times. Now we got to do it again. He needs stitches, Sato says. I look down at my gloves. I go to the kitchen for ice, take off the bandage, and ice Daddy's head, even though he slaps my hand away when I do. Sato sweats... Sato wipes sweat from his forehead and down the rest of the pop and downs the rest of the pop I gave him. You should have let the police take him, he says. I look at Daddy and get so mad down deep inside that I want to make take something and hit him. You want to be taking care of me, I want to yell, protecting me from the cops, not me protecting you. Then I do what I don't want to do. I call Dr. Mitchell. He ain't at the office, so I try him at home. Is your father there? I ask Sora when she finally picks up the phone. No, she says, hanging up. I call right back. I tell her I really have to talk to her dad. It's Wednesday, she says. He don't work in the office today. He's making rounds at the hospital, and you better not bother him there. I look over at Sato and my dad. Zora, that's all I can say. You finished, she asks. Zora, I can tell she's going to hang up. Daddy, He's not your father, he's mine. So you and your mom stop trying to hog him up like the words fall out my mouth faster than rotten peaches from a wet paper bag. My father got beat up and the police brought him to my house bleeding and I need somebody to help me fix him up because mom is going to kill me if she finds out he's here. Zora is so quiet, it's like she's not even there. I would have given you the money, she said. Lent you more than that even. My father turns up, turns over, sits up, and coughs, then goes back to sleep again. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to let a person sleep when they get hit in the head, I ask. She hangs up the phone. I look at Sato. I walk over to my dad and press the cold, wet tissues to the knot on his head. The blood still won't stop, so I get more tissue and do the same thing over and over again. When the phone rings, I tell Zora to answer. Sorry. When the phone rings, I tell Sato to answer it. I'm going to have to call my mother anyway, I think, so don't matter if it's her on the other end. It's Zora, Sato says, handing me the phone. You shouldn't let a person sleep too long if they were hit in the head, she says. You have to wake them up off and on, like they did to your mother in the hospital. I pat my father's cheeks. Wake up, Daddy. He turns over and change falls out his pocket. Four quarters and a dime. I whisper the words so low, I ain't sure Zora hears them. I know how it feels when somebody steals from you. Zora, don't waste no time saying what she thinks. Good. Now tell my dad what you did. Your mother, too. I want to let Zora know that this is between me and her, not everyone else in the whole wide world. But my father starts talking crazy, saying he wants the money I just stole out his pocket. I gotta go, Zora. Zora, don't let me hang up before she tries to get in the last word. You need to tell my dad, Raspberry. I put the change back in my father's pocket. You want me to tell him so he can hate me, too? Zora, don't say nothing for a long time. Yeah, she says, hanging up the phone. Chapter 31. Sato's gone. Sato's gone. He said he had to go do something for his mom. 
Daddy sitting on the side of the bed holding his head, telling me to give him two more aspirin, even though he just took four. When your mother do in, he asks, feeling the knot in his head, looking at his hand and checking for blood. Soon, I tell him, glad his head stopped bleeding. Daddy stands up, zips his pants, and walks over to the chair by the door. I go to my drawer and take out a clean sheet and pillowcase. That boy that just left, he that one you're talking about liking? Satan? No, Sado, right? Satin. Satin? Sado. I don't know. Whatever. I tell my father that Sado had to go home. His mother and dad, his mom and dad were going to church and he had to watch his brothers and sisters. I pull off the bloody pillowcases and sheets and put on the clean purple ones with flowers. One day, my father says, wiggling his toes and checking out the bottom of his feet, I'm going to send you a case of sheets. Towels, too. Pretty ones. Pink, blue, ivory. I go to the window and open it real wide. You gotta go, I say. Right now. Daddy stays put, asking me if I got a comb he can use. I get loud on him this time. Ask him how come he don't care if he gets me in trouble with Mama. When he walks out the room, I'm right behind him, making sure he don't go into Mama's room and take nothing. He sits down on the couch, pulls out a pack of cigarettes, and lights up. When I get myself together, you're going to have more than you need, he says. Lots of pretty stuff. I stare down at the floor. You ain't got no money, Daddy, I say. My father goes into the kitchen and opens the fridge like he lives here, too. Then he says that he ain't always going to be broke down like he is now. I'm going to get me some help. Daddy's talking about going to a treatment center and getting his old job back at the office where he worked downtown. I sit down in the table, at the table and listen to him go on and on. When he say gonna, when he say he gonna buy me a diamond tennis bracelet, when times get better, I take my hand and slide it across the table real fast, watching the sugar bowl fly into the air and smash against the refrigerator. Sugar is all over the floor. I apologize to Daddy, then excuse myself to go to the bathroom, taking the cordless phone with me. Odd job, I say when I dial his cell phone number for the third time. Raspberry Mary, he says. What's up? My, you all right? He asks. He. He what, Ajab says, acting like you want to punch somebody right now. Say no done something to you, girl. I tell Ajab I ain't want nothing. Your daddy been by again? He there now, bothering you? I shut the bathroom door, sit on the stool with my feet and legs up. My father, Ajab says for me not to worry. He's coming up right, over right now. I lie, say daddy ain't here, that I heard he was round, that, that, I, that I heard that he was round Ajab's way yesterday. I'm just checking is all. Odd, just tells, odd job tells me he ain't seen daddy in weeks. Then he asks how come I'm talking so funny, sad and quiet. I just woke up, woke up, I say, standing up and unlocking the door. He says he'll talk to me later because he's watching somebody's ride right now. I hang up the phone. When I go to the living room, daddy's at the front door ready to leave. I wasn't even going to say bye or nothing. Going to take a handful of your mama's flowers, he says, pointing to the ones out front, just to sweeten me up some, he says, sniffing under his arms and making a funny face. Then me, he tells me how the peach seed he planted is growing real nice. And that one day people going to be glad he lived in the park because they're going to be able to eat some sweet, juicy peaches because of him. I look up and down the street to see if anybody's out. Miracle sitting on her steps. You saved my life, baby girl, daddy says, holding my face with his hands. You my own little angel. I look down at his feet. I ask where his boots went to. He says he sold them for a little something something. But he'll have some but he'll have some soon because he's headed for the corner right now. So he can hustle up some change. I pull up the flowers for Daddy and give him more than I should. He sticks them in his shirt pocket. I named it Raspberry, you know. You named what raspberry? I ask, keeping my eye on Miracle. My peach tree. I call it my raspberry girl. Daddy walks up the street, stops at Miracle's place like he knows her, and gives her some of his flowers. A few minutes later, he gets up, looks back my way, and waves, then walks up the street. Miracle don't stomp on the flowers like she did before. She don't get smart with me or come over to our place. She's just sitting there, watching Daddy walk away just like me. Chapter 32 oh, He did it again. Stole my money while I was in the bathroom, I guess. Most of it wasn't there, though. I put it in the bank, like Mama said. But I had 150 bucks under that rug, and he took it, just like before, after all I'd done for him. 
You stupid, Janae says. Should have kept it in your pocket or banked it. Anyhow, he's a crackhead. They always take in what's not theirs. We in my room with the door shut. Mama's on the phone seeing when the new beds, kitchen, and dining room sets she ordered going to be delivered to our new place. I tell Janae I'm going to get my money back no matter what. She says it's been a week since Daddy took the money, so it's spent by now. I don't care. He's going to give it back to me, even if i got to stand on the corner next to him while he begs for it. I tell her. Janae says that's mean, what I just said. But it ain't right for your father to take what's yours, to steal from his own blood. I ain't tell Mama about it this time. I took the sheets, gloves, and rags and dropped them in the alley behind Miss Evelyn's house while she was next door talking. We going over Janae's house, I tell my mother. She waves her hand and keeps on talking to the person on the phone. She's happy, I guess, because we can buy new stuff for once. I don't have to use leftover furniture like usual. We gotta hurry up, I tell Janae when we get to the end of my block. She says she don't want to go. I tell her she can stay here if she wants, but I'm going to get my money back from my father now. A half hour later, we get off the 27A, standing outside Ming's house, ringing the front doorbell. Why are you going to drag them into my business? I ask Ming when Subak, Ling, and Couch come out the house with him. Ming says Mai's on punishment again, and he got to watch out for Subak and Ling while his parents take her to some counselor. Subak's hair is bright pink today. What's up? She says. Sado is carrying Ling. Her hair is French braided with lots of yellow, blue, and green barrettes. Janae made me pretty, she says, smiling. I tell Ming he messed things up by bringing the cousins. I can't just take them any place. They're going to be scared. He looks at me like he wants me to be quiet. We go into Free Jack Park. That ain't no place for kids, I say. If Ming don't go, I don't go, Janae says, holding tight to his hand. They don't go, I don't go, Ming says, looking at the cousins. Oh, all y'all make me sick, I say, walking away from them. We walk in twos for the next ten blocks. Janae and Ming are first, the cousins, and then Sado and me. He got me by the hand. Every once in a while, I feel his thumb rub my sweaty palm. It's hard to be mad while he's doing that. Hard to concentrate on Daddy, too. In a way, I know what I'm doing is stupid. My money is gone, just like everybody says. But I still want to see my father. I want him to look me in the eyes and tell me how a person can steal from his own child. When we get to the park, Ming starts to back out. He says he might get in trouble bringing his cousins to a place like this. I look at him. His face is as brown as a ginger snap cookie, now that the sun's been beating down on it all summer long. His hair is braided all over and pulled back into a ponytail that goes past, way past his shoulders. He could pass for a Puerto Rican around this way. But the cousins, they are who they are. Ain't no kids in this park here. In this here park. Just grown-ups. Men playing craps over by the wall where the closed-down swimming pool is. Men sweating and cussing while they play in hoops and drinking beer. Women scratching and taking drug drags off cigarettes and weed. Crackheads and drunks all over the place. Uh, I don't see your dad. Let's go, Sato says, pulling me by the arm. I point to the other side of the park. He could be way over there. I can't tell from here. I say, bending down, then standing up with my tiptoes to see what I can see. Janae lets Ming's hand go. She comes over to me and says, we shouldn't be here. I stare into the park, feeling sorry for the trees that look shiny, look as shiny and half dead as the crackheads walking around here. I want to go home. Ling says, putting her arm around my waist. Subak is so quiet, she ain't shaking her butt around this place. She all up under Ming and Janae. Y'all can go, I tell him. I'm going to find my father. Ah, oh, man, Ming says, getting mad. You and my get on my nerves. Never listen to people when they tell you the right thing to do. I look at Seda, wanting him to take up for me. He's staring into the park. Every week somebody dies in this here place. Everybody goes or nobody goes, Janae says, putting her arms around my shoulder. We girls, so I gotta go, she says, staring at Ming. Ming says something in Korean. Ling and Subak laugh. Oh, Ming, I'm gonna tell on you, Ling says, taking her fingers and digging them into Couch's ear. He growls at her, then walks over to me and lays down by my feet. Couch will bite if I tell him to, Ling says. Sado looks at me like I ain't got good sense. 
let's just go and get it over with.